Okay, <laughs> do again. It's... Okay, so I'm pleased to introduce the uh, keynote speaker, David Oran. Uh, he was uh, uh, until 2015-6 of error at this Cisco Systems, and he is now independent and publishing, pursuing his research interests in many fields. He is also one of the main contributors in our field. Also, I think that the most party participants know he very well. Today, he will give a retrospective on 10 years of ICN research and also future 10 years. Thank you, Beth. So I'm tempted to say good morning, but there are probably people in every single time zone. So. I'll just offer my personal welcome to the ICN 2022 conference and uh, wish you uh, much intellectual stimulation from the many very good papers, panels, and other activities that we have over the years. I have some amount of time working on ICN, uh, but I should try to put this in a little bit of perspective. Um, I thought about giving a talk trying to cover the field in general. And then I realized that was way too big to do. And then I thought about other keynote speeches that people give, which basically is a recitation of their curriculum vitae and what research they've done. And that, that seemed uh, a little bit too personalized. Um, so I try to blend some things together in this talk, which is to talk about not every aspect of the research that we've been doing on this area of ICN over the last 10 years, 12 years or so. Um, because there's way too much to cover. So what I decided to do was to choose some areas that at least I had some uh, involvement in, uh, not necessarily to promote uh, the research that I've done, but to be able to at least be semi-credible in terms of talking about um, various parts of the research. Now, uh, this isn't my first rodeo in the sense of having done some research in networking. Um, I'm probably the oldest person in the room almost certainly am. I did my first research project in networking in 1969 in satellite downlinks. Uh, and I've done a whole bunch of things over the years, uh, some with decent impact, some with less impact. And you can see from the emojis uh, my reaction in terms of what things that I've been involved with over the years that have done well and some of the things that maybe haven't done so well. So I have some strong hope that the work uh, that all of us have done in, in ICN uh, we'll uh, wind up with a, uh, with a smiley emoji uh, when we look back on this in another few years. So uh, why did I get interested in ICN? Uh, at the time, which was a couple of years after Van published his uh, seminal paper on the subject of contact networking, um, I was working with, uh, at a research lab that I, I, I formed at Cisco Systems with a, with a team of great people. Uh, and we were looking for, for things that might have a big impact on Cisco's business. So one of the things that struck me about ICN is that it was essentially a very disruptive technology to the networking industry. If you work for a company that built networking devices like routers, and somehow they tell you one day that all the protocols that you developed for the router were all obsolete, and we have all these cool new protocols based on information-centric networking, uh, that could do a lot of interesting things to a product line of a company that was multi billion dollars. So uh, I would manage to get uh, folks at Cisco interested in this area because um, there was an opportunity possibly, but mostly, very honestly, due to Pete. Um, for me personally, I think that the most attractive thing about working in this area was that it was an opportunity to look at some hard problems that people had sort of gotten plateaued onto the asymptote of improvement um, over the years, but start from a different set of assumptions about how the network should be built and see if those hard problems could engender more solutions that were different from what we had. And then there was the crazy aspect of this, which is that the conventional wisdom for probably the last 30 years is that keeping state in the network is a really bad idea. Um, IP won out over technologies like ATM and over technologies like um, because of its desire to keep as little state in the 
And then we're looking at this and saying, gee, this is turned on. It's we're keeping per, not just per flow state in the network, we're going to keep per packet state. Now, that, this is a really crazy idea. But the world has changed, and memory is a whole lot cheaper than it used to be. Well, everything's cheaper, but memory costs have come down on a steeper curve than either computing costs or communication costs. So the relative costs of the various resources needed in order to build a networking system um, in terms of what the resources are, those ratios have changed somewhat. So it might be interesting to take a look and see if those trade-offs have changed. Now, I'm going to give away the punchline here. Um, uh, so you maybe want to keep it in your head if you about what I'm trying to convey in which is that there's really two pieces to this technology that we work on. There's the information-centric part of this, and then the networking, classic networking part of this. So if you look at things from an information-centric point of view and don't think much about the networking technology, you come up with one set of things that are interesting to work on and assumptions about how things should work. And if you go the other way and you say, well, I, I really want to look at networking problems, but maybe look at them in the context of thinking about applications and systems. And these two things are not identical. So what do I mean by this? There are different emphases. So if you look on the left, the problem sets that we think about for the information-centric part of this whole problem space are things like, what are the forms that names take? Um, should they be hierarchical? Should they be graph-based? Uh, should they be attribute-based names? There's a large design space for how you actually use names to convey information-centric properties. Secondly, there's the issue of namespace design, which is if you're designing an application, how do I structure the names for that application? How do I structure the objects of information that get named? There are the, the security aspects of how you get object integrity and confidentiality. How, when you get that, you decide what you trust aspects of what parts of that confidentiality or integrity you actually are trusting, how you manage that. And lastly, um, how consumers and producers of data interact. What are the, what are the interchange both protocol and state movement um, that define how the information center is. And on the networking side, if any, for those of you who are classic networking people, this set of this set of things should look very familiar to you. There's routing, there's forwarding, just control, there's mobility, there's the security of your networking devices, and there's privacy aspects against the surveillance. So we have both of these things going on, and, 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 and deciding which pieces you work on have some effect on how you think about uh, information. So I don't have time to talk about everything, so I've chosen a few things to talk about. Uh, mostly on the networking side, because as you can see from earlier, I'm a, I'm a networking person at heart. And the information center part of that is another new spin. So I'm going to talk a bit about routing, I'm going to talk a bit about forwarding, and I'm going to talk a bit about congestion control, but not about the things at the bottom. Not because they aren't interesting, not because they aren't important, but because those aren't things that I personally thought about. And then on the left-hand side, um, I, I'm going to talk about the interaction of consumers and producers with data, uh, because that's an area that I've been working on. The other things, again, are just as important but um, I don't have time. So let's start with routing. An observation is that when we started thinking about doing information-centric networking, this idea of being able to route directly on names at the network layer, this is an incredibly seductive idea. It, you have much more semantic content to deal with to do smart things than you do with things like addresses that are short, that are topological, and that identify physical attachment points to the network as opposed to information that resides in. So finally, we're going to get some kind of location-independent routing using content. Great idea. And we may be able to accomplish this because the routers now, because we have a new packet format we can define, we're not stuck with, with the 128 bits we have in the packet. 
um, we have a lot more bits in the packet to play with, so we can do more sophisticated things. But this kind of naming hierarchy doesn't help you very much, at least in terms of how you route, if the names don't follow the network topology. You just run into all kinds of interesting uh, problems in that way. And although the popular ICM protocols we have today tend to route on hierarchical names, but there are interesting ideas that we could explore about routing on attributes or on graph names, right? Where the names are digraphs, or hopefully not shift, but they're digraphs rather than just simple trees. And you have to keep in mind that radical routing protocols have to scale. They have to work in large systems. And the scaling properties of the routing protocols we know about all operate as the product of the amount of state they teach and the rate at which that state changes. So anything we want to do in routing has to deal with both keeping state and dealing with the rate at which that state changes, either due to external factors, failures, policy changes, um, externalities of various. So over the years, we've tried a whole bunch of things to try to make uh, name-based routing. Uh, over a single administrative domain of reasonably small scale, we've used link state interdomain, uh, interdomain pro, um, sorry, interior gateway protocols like NLSR. We've tried multi-ring DHT, distributed hash tables, to try and scale this up really big. Uh, we've tried bloom filters, which um, have somewhat non-deterministic behavior, but tremendous state compression uh, in terms of how much state they have to feed. We've tried on-demand calculation, which is to just try and find paths on the topic to run it. And we've tried a whole bunch of other things. Uh, the literature in this, in this area is, is fairly good. To date, none of them have been able to achieve internet-wide scale, and none of them so far have been able to really achieve multi-autonomous scale. Not for lack of fun. So, so far, if you wanted to build a practical system and deploy it using ICM protocol, we've wound up punting to some kind of name translation service to translate the uh, location independent non topological name into something, either names or some form of addressing, that has the kind of topological scaling that we need. Some people have fallen back to DNS, and I sort of say, sorry. You might try a translation service that at least has some credible claims to being able to scale uh, to internet size. And one of my um, favorite examples of that is the global naming service of the Mobility First Project. It's a distributed package approach, but it has some nice problems. Or you can simply say, well, you know, if you want to be able to make routing work, you don't just give a single name to an object. You allow the producers of objects to give them multiple names, each of which has some topological significance. So when they go to publish data, they publish it in multiple places, and then they package together these topological names in a big structure folder. So do we have a lesson here about routing? Well, I think there are a few. 40 plus years of working on routing, nobody's cracked this state time rate problem for, for scaling it. it. It seems to be pretty tiny. But that's not lost. Uh, lots of interesting applications don't need to work with internet scale. They can work at sub-internet scale, either by just not being that big, or by tunneling through something else to connect islands that are small enough to be able to do the route. However, I don't think there are too many applications that can deal and be useful economically without dealing with the multiple autonomous system problem. There aren't a lot of applications that just run inside a single administrative domain. You never talk about anything outside of that. So I think we really have an opportunity to tackle the problem of a good name-based routing protocol that operates reasonably uh, in the multi-OS. That's all I have to say about routing. Now let's move on to uh, which is the data plane operation. So the early approach um, to, uh, to forwarding was uh, to 
see if we could make all this very rich functionality that was defined in the early uh, protocols work um, to demonstrate that you could really do sophisticated things at layer three to decide how to forward path. So for example, um, the original CCNX and later NDN uh, protocols um, allowed you to do prefix matching against cache data. And this had a very nice sort of seductive property that it allowed you to integrate content discovery with forwarding. So you could use the forwarding machinery to do content discovery directly without actually knowing the full name of something that you want to do. That often applications need to traverse not, not just fetch a single object, but traverse objects um, in the collection of objects, either their sequence, their time sequence, or their directory, or whatever. So selectors were added to the protocol to enable consumers to say how to traverse collections of objects. And then if you decide to allow those two things together with the caching of data, you wind up needing these things called exclusions because things you don't want returned from the cache might wind up. So exclusions were added to the protocol right sort of very much at the beginning. Uh, so you could bypass things that you really wish had wound up in it. And at the time, um, many of us will remember this, the general thought was, well, let's not worry too much about performance. Um, premature optimization is a really bad idea. It freezes your ideas too early. doesn't allow you to experiment very much. So if all you worry about is how do you make something go as fast as possible, uh, then you wind up pitching all kinds of good ideas because you just haven't had the time to think hard enough about how to make things. But I didn't believe this. Some of you in the room who worked with me know that you know I sort of railed against this. So no, 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 no. I don't believe this. A few things. Making things go fast. It's pretty interesting as a, as a networking technology person by itself. Right? Just try to make things go fast. It's interesting. If you don't try to make things go fast, you really can't find the big O problem. Order of not order Order n. Or ordering squared polynomial. Um, so if, if, if you don't actually try, you don't necessarily discover that we don't have a scalable algorithm in order to do some of the function. And it's good to know what the bottlenecks are right away. Uh, because we've changed the ratio of cost of different types of resources, um, we're, we, we didn't know like we know for IP and some other protocols exactly where you're going to wind up having bottlenecks in the system. So you really want to look at, at, at trying to make something go fast in order to figure out what's your bottleneck resource. Is it the same as the bottleneck resource to see in conventional protocol, or is it going to be different? So what we did um, in, in our team in Cisco was we said, well, yeah, let's just build an ICN router. I mean, a real one, not a toy, and try to make ICN work. So this, um, this ran on a service card that had an Intel processor and a bunch of memory uh, that was on the back plane of a, of a shipping commercial Cisco router called the 9K. Uh, we did pretty good on performance. It was uh, well over a million packets per second and 20 gigabits per second in 2013. Uh, and we have a lot faster structure here. Uh, and we learned a whole bunch of really interesting now, I, I want to take a little bit of a diversion here to make an apology. My apology is, I think I know why the Typhoon didn't go solid. Which is because when we shipped this router to Hong Kong to demo at SIGCOM 2013, the Typhoon hit Hong Kong. And uh, they canceled a whole day of the conference. Uh, so perhaps it's because we were doing an ICN router, uh, and I'm talking about ICN here, the Typhoon didn't. I don't know, maybe. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty proud of this work from, from the team that, that built it because a, a number of the key algorithms have made it uh, solidly into almost all the other uh, attempts to build really fast ICN forwarding over the years. So what did we learn? Well, one thing we should have known going in, but we had to relearn, is that routers are not optimized to do a lot of computing. Every single time. They're optimized to move data over buses and crossbars. 
you know, get something from one input into another input in the case and not touch, touch as little as possible. And certainly not mutate state law. That memory bandwidth was the very clear bottom. That's the bottleneck resource for any kind of sophisticated IC forwarding that I've seen. And it seems to be the persistent bottleneck going forward. This is what you're going to run. And that again, your selection of algorithms is probably the single biggest effect on performance. Um, so, for example, we tried a bunch of different techniques, wound up showing the hashing of uh, one big over two five and, and other data structures for, for rel. Uh, we tried the fastest known hash at the time, which was sitting hash before. Since then, uh, there's Dave Anderson's super hash, but at the time, that was not, not available. But that turned out to be massively insecure because it's susceptible to crafty packet attacks um, that cause a hack. So we switched to a more secure hash called SIP hash. And then, by luck, we learned this had a tremendously useful side benefit for hierarchical names, which is that it would be startable. You could hash part of your prefix, and then if you had to look deeper for Long's prefix map, you could then, without starting all over again, you could restart the hash on the next hierarchical side. So SIP hash turned out to be a big thing. And that um, clever engineering for these, these problems also matters, not just data. So uh, one of the things we, we, we work hard on is to get data structures uh, that could exploit the simple instructions on an Intel processor. A good example of this is uh, we, the data structure has, uh, when you have hash bucket collisions, the, the hash buckets were all uh, linearly put together in a single hash line. You could run one, uh, send the instruction for matching against uh, all the all the collided hash points. That um, any good system has to deal with either very short names or very long names, have good both good worst case and average case behavior. Um, so we came up with some not terribly elegant, but I think fairly um, fairly useful optimizations in order to have a good worst case behavior when the names are very long. And also good average case for the kind of popular main structures that, that we can use. Uh, you probably saw this coming. Um, we learned that there, there are three features in NDN and CCNX which were absolute performance. Uh, not by 2%, not by 20%, but by one to two orders of magnitude of performance. And the reason for this was the number of memory accesses we needed to do in order to provide. So it blew our memory access budget by one to two order of magnitude. So we pitched um, the, the router we built didn't do prefix matching on, on the content store, didn't do selectors, and we didn't even try to do exclusion. Uh, because that clearly has at least linear uh, overhead with the number of exclusions. So some lessons we learned in full. The first is um, I still believe in trying to go fast in form protocol design. And that, please remember, routers and switches are not servers, uh, even if they have a general purpose. Both CPUs and VRAM are not really adequate to the kind of our whole. And I'll put a pitch out to some of the work done here, uh, trying to marry, or the socket, marry servers and switches together so that the right things are done in switch hardware and the right things are done. That looks like a, a good So let's move on and talk about congestion. This is my favorite talk for a variety of reasons. Um, one is that stateful forwarding makes congestion control really, really different from what we do without. You have hop by hop feedback because you have stated every hop. You can get your feedback for responding to congestion from the bottleneck limit rather than waiting for feedback to come from the far end. Okay? So it can be much more responsive to congestion um, than it can in what we see with IP and TCP. We're not constrained by limited bits in a defined header. So 
what people had to do, for example, to try to make things like ECN work when you had two bits to play with and you had to sort of try to figure out what the what the congestion rate that you should be sending at by looking at multiple packets to be in to sort of do the, do the statistics in this meeting. We have a lot more bits to play with so we can do something. And by the really key for is that since we are doing symmetric forwarding, Routing. Congestion state is also similar. So you don't have to worry about you send something in one direction. You really want the congestion feedback to come back to you, but the returning packets are going over a different path. So the, the, the twain never meet. I mean, particularly if there's a bottleneck link in one direction, it's not the same as the bottleneck. So, how do we exploit these properties to get better? Feedback? Well, one thing we can do is we can shape traffic up by hop. And uh, there's a number of papers on, on the subject. Um, the, the key idea here is that you can shape interest messages to um, going forward. You, by implication, can control the rate of data coming back in the inverse lane. This allows you to get much higher link yield rates of traffic blocks. And uh, one of these papers demonstrated that um, you run IP over this link, you can get maybe 92. 90 to 92 percent link utilization before you stop dropping the packet. This scheme got well over 98, almost 99 percent link utilization. And we can make great things. Boy, people have tried to make this work in the IT world for a number of reasons. Even if it's been made to work, uh, it wound up not being deployed. So we have room in the packet for the actual rate of the bottleneck room. Which is cheap to compute and cheap to feedback in the data message that comes back. And it doesn't even have to be the data message that was broke by your interest. It can be a data message coming back for somebody else that just happens to be traversing the same path as your path. So you have a much shorter feedback loop. And if you're congested, you can knock back to the source um, and get shorter retransmission time. Now, um, when we brought this up, Everybody said, oh, God, that's just source punch all over again. What a really bad idea. Everybody decided 25 years ago that source punch was a really bad idea. But this is different because with source punch, you could drop the source punch messages through the congestion. And in, in these schemes, because you can book the return bandwidth based on the arrival of interest, you have guaranteed bandwidth on the return path by accepting that interest to carry a knack from the screen. So you never drop congestion. And lastly, we can police the interests when we're overloaded, and because we know the rate of the reversal. Because of the spin up this has some very nice properties in terms of not having to trust the endpoints to reduce their rate in a trustworthy fashion when they get congestion. You can actually get congestion. We also can do multipath forward. Um, you can learn multiple paths and maintain a rate for each of those paths. And once you have the rate for these learning paths, you can now proportionally strip, uh, you can proportionally split the traffic over the path. And PTCP claims to be able to do this, but it has a very long learning time to figure out how much traffic to put on the path because they don't have the explicit rate for them. You have to depend on the traffic drops and the CM drops. Now, I've just painted you a very rude It has some limitations. For one, uh, just from the interest arrival, you actually don't know how big a data packet you expect. The interest packet for something that's going to return a 20 byte sensor reading looks almost exactly the same as an interest packet that's going to send back 4K worth of video traffic. So um, you can't just get away with doing simple interest in order to do the shaping. There's some ways to fix this. Um, they're pretty well known, but they, they haven't they haven't actually been tried in practice. So I'll make a pitch if somebody wants to actually look into this and see how much better you can do. It's a relatively straightforward thing to uh, simulate. And then, of course, the ratio in size between interest packets and data packets affects the efficiency of the shaping scheme because you have to know um, to some extent how much bandwidth on the reverse one to reserve for interest coming in. 
And then, again, there's no magic. There are some fundamental congestion control problems that you're going to have to deal with no matter what your protocol architecture is. One is that the uncertainty in the end-to-end -end round trip time can be very long. So how pessimistic should you be in your resort analogy? If you assume worst case, you're going to underutilize your limits by significant factors. If you guess wrong and it's too small, you're going to wind up with congestion that you didn't experience on the return one and need things like AQM in order to uh, be able to drop traffic. And then you need all the other recovery techniques that we were trying to avoid by shaping the interest in the first place. And then second, uh, if the link rank is changing faster than the RTT, the round trip time of the link, uh, which is true for some wireless things, uh, you're going to get errors. You're going to get shaking errors. And this is, this is sort of like a fundamental thing in congestion control. Um, if anybody can figure out how to um, dynamically adjust congestion rates faster than an RTT, good luck. You will win a prize. And then lastly, not everything we tried that we thought was going to be a really good idea worked out terribly well. You'd think that by having congestion signaling hot by hot, um, that would allow you to make ne in-network retransmission of packets uh, a really kind of cool idea. So you try to send something, the link you want to send it on is congested, further upstream, not the one connected to you. You get a congestion knock back, but you have another path, so you retransmit the interest inside the network on the other path. Now, this is a really cool idea, right? but unfortunately, what the consumers see is they see an inflated RTT, and that inflation isn't just due to the propagation time over the path, or even the marginal queuing delay that was accumulated on the working path, but the, all the accumulated delay of the retransmission. So um, it really confuses the endpoints because when you start doing a network retransmission, the, the, the RTT that they think they're seeing uh, in order to um, adjust their, their input rates is fluctuating all over the map. And we did a few experiments to try and see what we could do about this. Um, unfortunately, my, uh, my group got blown up before we could work with the I think it can be fixed, but there's probably uh, some significant uh, complexity cost in making in-network retransmission really an attractive approach. Um, Again, I'd encourage people that if you can be really clever about this, um, it, you might find um, an interesting paper or two, at least. So let's try and sum up congestion control um, and some lessons that we've learned. First of all, congestion control is a research. Is a research is not a project. It's a career. Um, if you decide to get involved in congestion control, don't think you'll be able to publish one paper hold up the flag, I succeeded, and go off and do something. I heard this the first time uh, in the early 1980s when some of my colleagues at that time at Digital Equipment Corporation proposed the congestion project, which resulted in the, what was called the death bid at the time and later ECN to the head of the networking division. And he told them, that's not a project, that's a career. And in fact, it turned out to be a career. And all the people who worked on it, KK Ramakrishnan, Raj Jain, coming to essentially spend much of their entire careers working on congestion. So <clears throat> it's fun to wade in. It's a very hard problem. It's very rewarding, intellectually challenging. Uh, but don't think you can just go in and do something like congestion control. And, you know, um, if you bothered to pay the high price of per packet state in the network, let's try to leverage it as much as possible. Right? Pay that price in, in, in memory. Um, and the memory bandwidth needed to do it. Uh, let's figure out how we can make the most out of having made that fundamental architecture. And lastly, <clears throat> nothing I've talked about here in congestion control satisfies anybody's fantasies about doing quality of service. Right? Um, it doesn't distinguish classes of traffic. Um, it doesn't allow you to do differential um, resource allocation for different classes of traffic. It, but what it does do is it protects the network from overload. And the protocols that we have already and the algorithms we have already have reasonably demonstrated uh, good fairness properties. Now, should, I, should you go work on quality of service for ICN? Maybe, I don't know. 
I've thought about it a bunch. Um, there probably are some interesting things to do there. But let's move on to the left-hand side of the equation talk a bit about the interaction models that applications use and what their implications are for how you structure the protocols and what you do in the network. So applications use a whole variety of interaction models. We know about content sets, right? That's the poster child for ICM. Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that. We've been there, done that. Um, uh, to the extent we know how to do anything <laughs> with ICM protocols, we know how to fetch content. Uh, you can have an interaction model, which is the, the process of synchronizing some shared state among a bunch of participants. And there's been a variety of these synchronization protocols using <clears throat> particularly NVM. Um, but uh, it's, it's not what one would call a completely solved pro problem yet. And I'll point people to the systemization of knowledge paper in this year's conference that looks at the history of these sync protocols, uh, how they've worked, how they've evolved over time, and, and where there are opportunities to, to do better. There's publish subscribe, very popular interaction paradigm. Consumer producers publish the availability of data. Consumers subscribe to the new data or the changes to the data and, and either have it pushed to them or can fetch it. There's um, the classic distributed computing remote procedure call model uh, where you do re remote invocation of a computation. And there's been research in that starting quite early in the, in the history of the last 10 years through things like named function networking and named functions as a service. And more recent work, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about because I was involved in it, on things like uh, RICE, um, which is doing RPC over, over ICM, compute first networking, which is building distributed systems and reflexive calls. And lastly, um, how can you leverage this to get the full richness of what we have with RESTful transactions in the web? So I don't have time to talk about, well, I only have time to talk about one of these interaction paradigms. So I'm going to talk about the remote invitation one because it's the one I need And I may talk a little bit about RESTful transactions at the very end of the talk. And there's a position paper about how to do RESTful transactions with ICN. It's going to be part of one of the panel sessions. Later. So something I want to convince you of is that doing computations is really different from fetching data. Most fundamental probably is that you need to deal with the different time scales. Computations can run for many network RTTs. So sending an interest and waiting for the computation to complete, potentially for many RTTs in the network, has, has some pretty bad implication. There's too much state held for too long in the network, and that state is not robust against any kind of network failure if there's a topology change that, that, that wasn't that state to get thrown away. Input data to computations matters a lot, not just the output data. So how do you deal with input data? Do you, do you push it in your request? Um, but if you push too much interest in the request, um, all this unsolicited data has two bad problems. It screws up congestion control, and it can form a computational attack against your server. You trust the caller, right? Uh, often, in order to do a computation, you need authorization tokens from a caller, so you don't do computations based on the on, on bogus input. So proving your identity in the, directly in the request sacrifices this consumer anonymity property we have in the base protocols, because you're now revealing who you are in the interest message that you sent. And that most interactions, if you look carefully at how you're doing distributed computations, need more than a two-way hinge. Right? Otherwise, you need expensive retries, and you need potentially to have independent uh, interactions going in the opposite direction for things like callbacks. So there's been some evolution of this research. In 2018, um, a bunch of us, this paper called RICE, which um, did reasonable solutions to some of the more fundamental problems. So it avoided big request messages. It separated the initiation of a computation from the delivery of the result by using um, a network version of futures, um, which we call funks, because that was the term used in the early days of LISP. Um, it allowed you to do client authorization without losing anonymity on the network. And it's supported um, through uh, the way you did the naming conventions, both idempotent 
functions and not non asymptotic functions. So functions that kept no state at the server side, you were able to cache results and reuse them for future indications of the same function. For non item potent um, transactions, it very clearly separated them so you did not get fooled and return stale results from cache. So there's been work since then to try and extend this to instead of just dealing with individual calls, to actually be able to build up full distributed computations with lots of uh, microservice pieces. Um, and that was in ICM-19 called Compute First Networking, which thought about the problem of how do I take the interaction model that the application specifies in its code and actually generate um, all the pieces necessary to run the protocols automatically. And we succeeded in doing that. And we tried to do all the placement algorithms using name-based routing. And um, uh, the paper's more optimistic probably than it should have been. I would say we actually failed on that count um, because we wound up having to use uh, forwarding hits in order to make sure that the packets got speed. So um, we've been thinking about this some more over the last couple of years, and there's a new uh, draft in the ICNRG called Reflexive Forwarding, um, which modifies the base protocols in a way to provide support for these kinds of interactions. So some lessons we learned from this. First, um, content fits with two-way handshakes I would claim is a very poor match for doing distributed computation. You need something more. And that ex if we think about some, some fairly simple extensions to the base protocols, we may be able to get this narrow waist underpinning that will support multiple interaction models in a clean way, not just the two way uh, fetch. Now, stepping back a second, um, I think it's useful since I've made this point about trying to keep. Um, the emphasis on, on the networking parts of ICN and the IC parts of ICN somewhat separate to look at two extreme data points. The first one is something called HICN or hybrid ICN, which really tried to get the networking benefits of stateful forwarding, congestion control, and routing without worrying too much about all the information sensitive parts of it. So, this project um, uses IPv6 packets, so no new packet formats, and stole bits from the transport headers for the DMUX uh, with no fancy naming and no object security, none of those wonderful things that we, we, we like on the information centric side. But they got most of the nice routing, forwarding, congestional properties that we get that I talked about earlier in this talk. So if you like the way ICN approaches the networking problems of routing, forwarding, and congestion control, um, HICN allows you to take that benefit without bringing in the other side. And then on the flip side, you can look at something like OSPOR, um, which deals with the information-centric parts of this in a fairly natural and, and, and extensive way. Um, because it has hierarchical naming, it does secure objects, it has web-like semantics, um, but there's no help from the network. Everything's done at layer seven. So it just runs on top of a standard style. Transport. So since you have no help from the network, um, you need proxies and caches at layer seven. And one detail, which I think is now being worked on to uh, help with the item potent operations, is interactions today are tied to transactions um, or soft core uh, rather than the objects themselves. So there's some group keying and new work in OSCore that actually will allow you to have um, uh, interactions based on objects alone, not worrying about the transaction. So these are two useful extreme data points to see, you know, if you emphasize only one side of the equation, what you wind up. All right. So that's a bit of the history. Let's let's try to look ahead. And I have two sort of ways I, I, I want to communicate this. One is what can we learn from this prior research that can we use to guide these some of these things I've already mentioned. And some of the lessons that I, that I put down that I think I've learned, are they really good lessons? And I would encourage you, don't take those at face value. Question those lessons. Were they really the right lessons to learn? Are they, are, are they wrong? Should we, should we look at this again? So, big warning. 
this is all speculation. Um, predicting is always difficult, particularly when it involves the future. So here are some of the things where I think there's, there's good new landscape. So existing landscape that needs further exploration. So one is trying to get right the trade-offs between what you do up at the application layer and what you do by pushing functionality down to layer three and potentially to layer two. Um, how, how, do you get the, how do you get to the sweet spot there? And, and two things I think are important is um, experimenting with what the APIs are, I think is pretty key here. If you pick the wrong API, um, you can be really messed up. I have a couple of poster child examples of this in the world of IP that I, I, I don't find you would be too upset to talk about here, but we don't want to make those same mistakes um, as we develop our IT and IP. And be very careful about what the metrics you choose are. Um, one of the general failings of our community is to think that um, throughput and latency as performance metrics are the only interesting metrics. There are other interesting metrics like flexibility. And I think as we've learned, should have learned better, um, resilience, uh, failure resilience, uh, as opposed to reliability or availability in a strict sense. Um, are important metrics in, to, to use to evaluate new architectural approaches uh, to network. Can we have a single narrow waist uh, that works well for multiple interaction models? The existing narrow waist is the two-way handshake for content. If you believe what, if you believe my arguments that that's not adequate, do we have a slightly bigger or slightly different narrow waist that becomes useful and can be used for all the different interaction models. So we know it works for content fetch, but what about the narrow waste for sync, for RPC, for RESTful web, and for PubSub? And since um, I, we're really interested in feedback on this reflexive forwarding uh, scheme, is this sort of the right approach for a narrow waste, or do we need more, or do we need something different? Are we on the right track or the wrong track? It's something like reflexive. Yes, congestion control still appeals. We're never going to be done. Well, never is a long time, but I don't think we're going to be done for quite a while. Perennial issue with many subtle, subtle things to work on. One of the trade-offs that's very different potentially in ICN than IP is how much you have to trust applications to respond to congestion signals or packet drops versus getting it all enforced by the network protocols. And while there's been some good work done in multi-path congestion control for ICN, um, it's, still, it's still an area that's right for, for, for further uh, interesting uh, research that can do. And dare I say it, quality of service machine. Um, there's been some work done um, to be politically incorrect, I think most of what's been done so far. So some smart people tackling this in, in a more thoughtful way um, might bring us some, some interesting quality of service capabilities for us. And then hot right now is something called computing in the network. What functions of the network protocols at the higher layers can we instantiate inside the network devices? There's a research group in the IOTF looking at this called COIN, computing in the network. Uh, what function, ICN functions belong in switches? Uh, what can be done in the face of the constrained pro programming model we have in switches, which is non turing complete and memory, memory access uh, count limited? Um, and when you blow either of those things, you recirculate your packet through the switch and your throughput immediately drops back out. And do we really even need to think about this? So this way you think about ICN something where you don't need to move functions into the switches. You can, you can do it all in servers quite, quite reasonably with a more classic distribution. Okay. And then lastly, and we're gonna have a discussion of this in the panel. Um, I, one of the really cool features of our ICM protocols is they can do multi-destination. If multiple users request the same data um, through flow balance, uh, and the other properties, you can deliver the resulting data very efficiently to a large number of requesters without resorting to the kind of machinery that is used for IP. 
it seems to be a big win. Um, I haven't seen anything that actually goes out and proves this. Um, so a, a paper or, or some research that basically demonstrates that this works way, way better than things like IP multicast, the SSM form or, or other forms or layer seven CDN um, ways of, of tree-based spreading of traffic. Um, uh, that would be a, a, a really good contribution. But on the other hand, um, some of these interaction models, particularly SYNC, uh, and to some extent sub sub, um, are using multicast of interests um, in order to manage the interactions. And naively, this seems to suffer from the same pathologies that, that, that IP multicast suffers from. So can we overcome this? Can we do better when you have to do a multi-destination delivery of a, of a request than the properties we see with our, with our I think that's a potentially interesting thing to think about, uh, which I haven't. So maybe in the, in the panel discussion, some of these issues. So summing up the lessons that we've learned, um, here are four paragraphs of describing all the nice features of ICN. Um, that came out of um, feeding in the rest of this talk and seeing what, 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 how you could sum up the lessons. Um, but hang on a second, um, I didn't do this. Um, those paragraphs were generated with GPT-3. Uh, so uh, I don't think they're a really good way to sum up the lessons. Although GPT-3 is awesome. I, I, I really recommend people try it out. It's a, you know, just so you don't waste more than a few hours on it, because you can waste days on it. Um, it's pretty new. So let's try again. Um, so top level, how are the insights that, that we've gained from the ICN protocols inform the construction of real deployable information-centric systems and applications? How, where does name-based routing really fit in? Uh, can we use it to achieve robustness and performance scaling for distributed applications? Partly because I think distributed applications have this nice moder moderate scale. It's big enough to be interesting and, and have scaling problems, but doesn't blow you off into having to be able to scale to the size of the unit. So a single large distributed computation in a data center or a few data centers um, may be of the scale that could um, really benefit from a, not a native full-blown name-based realm. Um, where does caching actually help, right? And how do you best utilize the caches? Um, most of the work that's been done here has been comparing it to CDN caching and seeing if you can do better than CDN caching. Maybe, maybe we shouldn't use that as the baseline. Maybe we should think about it in terms of uh, application resilience application robustness, and not just um, uh, load on servers and latency, although those are, of course, important. What, where, where does it really help to push names down to the lower layers, where the lower layers can actually make use of the richness of the name structures to achieve better latency, better resiliency, better performance? And then, conversely, how can we use the insights of applying information centricity in applications to inform what are we bother to go through the very expensive long-term process of changing the network infrastructure to deal with it, and what just the trade-offs don't, don't support. So do things like multipath forwarding and in-networking transmission, this reflects the forwarding scheme I talked about, do they actually enable applications that are hard or impossible to do now? Or are they just sort of a, gee, this is another way to do things? And lastly, um, is there a big win in wireless networks, which are obviously increasingly important um, uh, compared with our, our legacy of terrestrial networks, in terms of optimizing the scarce resource, right? Um, I forget who said this, but God stopped creating spectrum a long time ago. Right? There, there is no new spectrum. So, um, so wireless spectrum is a scarce resource and will be until somebody figures out that Einstein was wrong and uh, Nyquist was wrong and Shannon was wrong. So can we get more robust wireless operation and more responsive mobility uh, by employing Einstein? 
So let me revisit the punchline to sum up here. Um, I'd state it somewhat differently. It's that what ICN is to me is it's the union of information-centric thinking and what we know to be the needs of building the network, as opposed to just their intersection. It's not the intersection of information-centric network and information-centric operation and network. It's their union. So um, none of this would have been possible without tons of really smart and dedicated collaborators I've had over the years. Um, this is a probably not a complete list. I'm not certain it's not a complete list, so I will offer apologies to the people who should be on this list but didn't make it. Uh, but they've made my uh, career and my uh, intellectual stimulation working on this uh, kind of networking are really rewarding for me. And I hope for those of you who continue to work in the field that it will be rewarding for you. So thank you very much for listening and all your questions. Thank you, Ben. So we have the, a few minutes to a question and answer. So maybe so currently, so there is no post in the Slack. So uh, is, there any, is there any question, suggestion from the floor? Please come to the mic. Hi, Alex. Uh, one thing I kind of wonder, you didn't mention security in your talk. But at least I don't remember. Uh, any lessons that we learned in the view to the future about uh, security and ICN? So, um, thanks. Um, again, it wasn't because I don't think it's as important or maybe more important than many of the other things. This is because it's not one of an area that I'm terribly competent in personally and haven't worked on very much. But I'll say a couple of things. One is um, there's security and there's privacy, and they're not the same. Um, we need to think about both. We thought mostly about the security aspects. We thought, thought some about the privacy aspects. Um, but there's a lot of work to be done in both. Um, I think one of the areas that our previous research in ICN has really advanced the state of the art is in having a single, relatively simple, straightforward way to achieve object integrity with origin authentication. Um, that is kind of universal, right? It didn't need to be done on an application basis. It didn't even need to be done in, in sort of the way people have thought about secure objects on the web, number one. And number two, I think it revitalized a lot of work on how you manage trust. Because the state of the art uh, before some of the work that was done in this community uh, came around, uh, Everything was simply based on, well, we have a PK on, right? And the PK part we understand, um, you know, maybe it needs to be you know, quantum safe in the future, but the infrastructure part of it is really problematic. We know this for the web. Um, and I think one of the big advances we've made is we now have a trust management infrastructure that doesn't depend on a classic PKI. So I'd say pushing that aspect of security forward, doing more work on trust and extending it to data provenance, which is actually an even harder problem, because what we have now allows you to prove the authenticity and integrity of an, of an object one by one, but not be able to track the mutation of the state that represents that object through computations, right? Christian Student did a little early work on this, but it really hasn't gone anywhere yet. But being able to use our trust schemas to manage provenance um, and figure out how to trace the evolution of secure objects um, uh, through, through, their, through their mutation, which happens in computational systems, I think is a, is a ripe area for further work. And uh, then, of course, privacy, which is fairly problematic. General. First of all, I want to say thanks, Alex, for bringing up the question about security. Uh, to me, I think security actually is the most attractive functionality of ICN. Because for other things, caching, whatever, you know, there's solutions. But you think it's good ones or bad ones, they are deployed ones. But also, I'd like to thank Dave 
for um, uh, for this uh, very very exciting, with interesting answers. I think you really brought up uh, this direction that is kind of why PPI has fundamental challenges, and therefore, in um, I think semantic naming really. I would say opens entirely new and promising direction to address the trusted policy and making it automatic instead of human uh, control. I want to bring up a different question though. I think uh, you, earlier in your talk, you mentioned about routing scalability. About what? I'm sorry. Routing scalability. Oh, routing scalability, right. Right before I got full time involved with the NDM project, I was a co-chair with Tony Lee for uh, routing research group. Routing research group, and we spent a few years to address the routing scalability problem for IT. What I meant to say is that routing scalability is not a new thing introduced by ICN. Instead, it's intrinsic in large scale systems. Absolutely. Absolutely. Agree completely. So that's about 15 years back. I remember at one of the IETF meetings, a few old, old people in the community got together. We joked about back in the early 80s, when the TCPIP first came out, there were three challenges. Security, routing scalability, and the congestion control. Now, this many years down the road, what had we solved? Congestion control seemed to be under control. Uh, whether we have this for TCP, whether we got the best solution or not, we got I would claim it isn't under control for multi-path. Let's, yeah. let's leave well, it there. Well, there's no multi-path uh, for TCP, honestly, at this time. So congestion is under control, but uh, security, still people didn't have much clue what is even the right framework that you point out? And the routing scalability, I think, was like, if I quote you, it's a career problem and not a project problem. Um, actually, I would say differently if I quote Yakov. Everyone knows Yakov, Yakov has a Yakov salon. He said, either the uh, naming follows the topology, or topology follows the naming. And clearly, topology follows the naming, but, I mean, but in scale. So naming follows the topology. That is, if you want to scale, uh, you have to have identifiers uh, space that follows the topology. Why that works? Because topology naturally is a hierarchical. And therefore, I think it's not so much I see it as a rotten scalability problem, but it's a generic problem that requires a mining for the things that's infeasible to put into your forwarding table. You might have those identifiers into the things that you can afford to put into the routing table. I specifically do not like the word uh, topology dependent or independent identifier space. There's nothing with topology dependent or independent. Today, we make a routing announcement, you inject into the routing table. Is that dependent or independent? You know, Google, Facebook, uh, iPod, they all own the IP prefixes. They inject that prefix. Uh, so like if a, I can interrupt for a second, it's not the injection that matters, it's the uh, aggregation. Is, that's precisely the point. So, you're right. So, so it's not whether, you know, 16 slash 8 uh, representing iPod, of representing topology. It's all about what you inject into the system. Right. So yeah. if you want your state to scale, you have to aggregate. But yes. if you can't aggregate without having some topological notion where True. The, all the information flows, flows everywhere. So uh, semantic names can also be aggregatable. Some of them, I'm not saying all. Right. So therefore, it's really about um, aggregatable identifier getting injected into the routing system. And the right. aggregatability of how much you aggregate, it's not a fixed solution like the routing table sites as we all know. Back 20 years, we 
cried, oh, the rotten table exploded. Today, it's already 10 times bigger. I assume it's still working. Okay. That, thanks to uh, the technology advances. That's all I said. Thank Thanks you very much for the great talk. Great, thank you. Last questions? Uh, maybe some more questions? Hi there, thank you very much for your talk. Um, I may misunderstand your point, but it seems that you said it's a little bit hard or difficult to provide a very first ICN louder. Is it true? Or for other research? So actually, I think that uh, um, is there any reason why the routing vendor don't care so much about the uh, ICN implementation? For example, so there are a lot of router vendors like Cisco, Huawei, Juniper, but uh, I wonder why they don't care so much about the router implementation and the, there was no, uh, no enough paper who have been working uh, for the far, so, very far ICN router. So this is the reason why you said that it's a little bit difficult to improve the fastness of the ICN router as an implementation. So that's why the vendor doesn't care so much. So ICN itself is really interesting. So the end user or application or we all so metaverse so such kind of end users application may be really question but the very core router implementation of that would be supported by the big router vendors don't care so much about the router implementation this is the reason why you said it, that so, improving the harshness of the ic router is really hard so, so this might be perceived as a somewhat snarky answer but it's the same reason that the router vendors didn't do ipv6 until it was almost too late Right? They are much more worried about protecting their installed base than doing new things. So it's the same level of IPv6? Well, then now everybody does IPv6 and they do it fast and they do it great, but they did it 10 years later than they should have. So ask me this question again in 10 years. Maybe the vendors will have figured out that ICN is something that they can make money on. Okay. Yes, yes, I, I agree with you. I agree. To him, so uh, terabit forwarding is possible using the before switch. Uh, sure. That's a that's the prototype. I know, so, I know. So maybe uh, if the ICS becomes a, a commercial site, right? anyway, vendors will. I hope that vendors will implement the terabit scale uh, routers. So it's my opinion. So yeah, thank you. So anyway, it's almost okay. okay. It's almost a time. So uh, there is one post. There was one post at the. <laughs> on the uh, Slack, so direct thank you, but so but we spent all the time, so maybe uh, uh, Dave will answer Dirk's question. Yes, just put any questions you have in the Slack, and I'll try to answer them as the day goes on. So maybe uh, Dirk ask the uh, comments. I mean, you know, not everything I say is completely defensible. <laughs> Uh, so, um, Dirk says, uh, Zeno, in, in the tutorial we had yesterday, seems to represent a class of systems that prioritize an information-centric application layer transactions. And Zeno seems to derive a suitable networking service for that, but not general purpose networking. How does this resonate considering the theme of the keynote? Well, um, I, I think Zeno picked an interesting um, design point different from the CCNX and NDN protocols. Uh, by allowing query strings uh, in the protocols in a somewhat different way from what selectors um, and, uh, and uh, prefix caching did for ICN, uh, CCNX and NDN protocols. Um, I'll point out that, you know, the way they make that go fast um, is to operate at reasonably small scale. So, um, I think the two things that, that we need to think about if we're to adopt something like that are how can you make this scale up? And second, um, and this came out in the, in the Slack chat for, for the Zeno tutorial, um, uh, there, the approach in Zeno today for security is they push channel security down and use conventional protocols for channel security below 
and they push object security up to the application, right? Um, that seems to be missing a prime benefit of the other ICN approaches like CCNX and NDM, which collapse um, everything into a single um, object security architecture uh, that doesn't rely on, on channel security, uh, except in a very minimal way for protecting individual links, um, and doesn't rely on the application to do anything other than um, the confidentiality, confidentiality aspect which for a variety of reasons I would argue belongs in the application anyway because of the need for selective encryption. So uh, I don't know whether that actually answers the question, right? Um, uh, it isn't clear to me how you push the Zeno approach down uh, into a lower layer or whether um, it, it, it's naturally like OSCOR in the sense that um, the way you build a large topology is to have layer seven uh, proxies and layer seven caches. Yeah, so it's a more time, so we will conclude the uh, this talk. So uh, thank you, Freddy. Uh, about 15 minutes, right? Delayed, so delayed, so maybe so. We will start.